Well, here we go. It's beginning to feel a lot like... Can you tell me why people stress about getting everything done before December 24? You can see it. You can feel it in the atmosphere sometimes. People are all, you know, there's projects that we've left undone for the last 11 months, but now they've got to be done by Christmas Eve. And then there's all the other staff, you know, there's the presents. And, and, and I, I know some of you have frowned at me, and, and I am changing. Thanks for your prayers. Uh, I, I, I loved the rush of the, the Christmas Eve uh, gift purchase, but I'm, I'm moving beyond that uh, and, and, and with some help from Lynn. In fact, what I say is, Lynn, you buy everything except for you, and, uh, and it's done now. So that was Lynn, by the way. How good was she at communion? Yeah. And she's rather cute to boot. So, when you think of all the stress and all the tension, and, and uh, I, I think road rage goes to the next level at shopping centers in the last two weeks before Christmas, and you think, this is in such radical contrast to the one that this season's all about. Because his name is Jesus, who is the Prince of, right? So why don't we just enjoy that? As we were reminded at, at communion today, it's all about love, joy, and peace through Jesus. And so why don't we today just enjoy him, the greatest gift of all. John 3.16 says, for God so, what? That he, right? You, you can't love without giving. And God loved us so much that he gave us his son. And, and we today, for the next, not only today, but right through the month of December, we're celebrating the gift, the greatest gift of all. And his name is Jesus. And speaking of gifts, we're going to turn it in the Bible today and we're going to look at a group of people that were probably the first to bring a gift to Jesus. Some of you know them as the wise men or the magi. I'm going to read to you that moment as it's recorded by Matthew in his gospel. Matthew chapter 2, verse 9. It says, after they had heard the king, they were brought before the king. They went on their way. And the star that they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were what? Overjoyed. On coming to the house, it says in verse 11, they saw the child with his mother Mary. They bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of what? Read it out loud with me. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. We're talking about all three of those things over the next few weeks. The Magi brought gold, frankincense, and myrrh. The, these were, um, by the way, spoiler alert, there was probably more than three of them. There may have been less. We actually don't know. Because there was gold, frankincense, and myrrh, we make this assumption that there were three. We don't know. I, am I already ruining your carols? And they weren't kings, sorry. They were, they were scholars from the Persian region. They were residents of what we would call today modern Iraq. And they traveled 1,500 kilometers from where they were and where they resided to the town of Bethlehem. That's more than a, 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 the journey that you would embark on from Brisbane to Townsville. And these three, or four, or seven, brought to Jesus gold, frankincense, and myrrh. We do know they weren't Jews. Hence, they did not necessarily have a lot of understanding of what we would call the Old Testament. But they were led by God to come to Jesus and present him with their extravagant gifts. Spoiler alert number two, sorry. I know... You've probably got around your house or somewhere around your neighborhood nativity scenes and they're there in the stable. Look at me. They weren't. So there wasn't three. They weren't kings and they weren't in the stable. We three kings, off the, off the song list, gone. Because when you follow the timetable, they probably arrived around the time that Jesus had already become a toddler. However, the time that they came doesn't really matter. But each of the three gifts that they brought do. 
because each of them were making a statement. Each of them showed incredible insight and each of them were prophetic in their nature. We do know that they were all men, they weren't women because if they'd been women, they would have arrived on time to help deliver the baby. And they may have brought more practical gifts. But these gifts were very, very significant. Last week, we started to look at the gift of gold. Gold prophesied that, Jesus, you are king. Gold demonstrates the majesty. Gold celebrates the majesty of Jesus, the one who is the king of kings. Today, we move to the second gift, frankincense. And the insight that's associated with this gift is actually quite profound. Gold, frankincense. Next week, we're going to be dealing with myrrh. But frankincense, you have to ask, why that gift? Have you ever looked at a gift that you were given and you go, why did you give me that? You may have said, I really don't deserve this. And you meant you really didn't deserve this. You, you may have said, and I remember one time someone gave me a gift and said, you shouldn't have. And they really shouldn't have. Um, Jesus, perhaps a baby, perhaps a toddler, receives these gifts. And, and, and if, if you were uninformed and you weren't enlightened, you, you would probably look at them and go, what are they about? But they were very powerful with the insight that they brought. Frankincense today. Let's have a look at what the Magi brought and why they brought frankincense. Frankincense is a white resin or gum. From it, we get incense. The Bible tells me in the book of Leviticus that it was the responsibility of the priest to burn incense on the altar as an act of worship. So when they brought the gold, they were saying, Jesus, you are the king. But when they brought the frankincense, they're saying, you are the priest and not any priest, but the great high priest, Jesus Christ. The incense represents prayers that rise to God in heaven. But we have to go from the Old Testament into the book of Hebrews to see the fullness of what that gift was all about, to see the fullness of the office of Jesus, not only being any priest, but our great high priest. The book of Hebrews is amazing. It has a number of defining marks as you read the book of, of Hebrews. The book of Hebrews has, has uh, some uh, words in there that are repeated and repeated and repeated. There's, there's a simple law in Bible uh, interpretation. One of them is the law of much mention. In other words, when God says something once, you need to take notice. When he says it over and over and over, you really, really, really need to take note. And in the book of Hebrews, the word better, say better, comes up over and over again. It's used more than a dozen times that Jesus is better. He brings to us a better covenant. He's better than the angels. He's better than the patriarchs. He's better than the prophets and he's better than the priests. Jesus is better. In the book of Hebrews, there's another thing that you'll see over and over, and it's this line, Jesus changes everything. How many can say that's my story? It was the story for the human race. It's my story too. When Jesus came, everything changed. There was a prophecy of Jesus before he's born, and it says, you will call his name Emmanuel, which means what? God with us. It, the, there's a duality to it. He was God, but he was also with us. He was the divine in human form. And in the human form, he fulfilled the office of the great high priest. Let me read it to you from the book of Hebrews. We're going to take, take a bit of a dive in there. I'm going to use, use a lot of scripture today because it literally amplifies what this gift of, in, of frankincense is all about. Hebrews 5. Verse 5 says, In the same way Christ did not take on himself the glory of becoming a high priest, but God said to him, You are my son. Today I've become your father. And he says in another place, You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. That, is a, that in itself requires a deep dive. I personally have a conviction that Melchizedek is a, a pre-incarnation expression of Jesus Christ. 
And God says of, of Jesus, you are my son. You're, a, you're of the order of Melchizedek who is without mother and father who lives forever. You are a special one. You're more than just an ordinary priest. You are the great high priest. That's why frankincense is significant. The baby in the manger would one day grow to become our priest, to become our great high priest. And because of that, there are implications that relate to you and I today, and they are profound. Here's the first thing about Jesus being our great high priest. Here's the first thing that really says, wow, when they brought the frankincense. Remember, these are Persian people. They, 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 they were counselors to kings in, in places like Babylon. They, they didn't grow, in, in, can I use common language? They didn't grow up in church. But God revealed himself. And can I tell you, in nations and in parts of the world, the Middle East, where they seldom hear the gospel, that is happening over and over and over again. I'm hearing from missionaries who are serving God in parts of the world where there's few churches, where there's few preachers. But you know what? God so loved the world. God loves people. He's revealing himself. He's speaking to them in signs and wonders and dreams and vision. And he's making his great love known to them in and through the person of Jesus. That's what happened with these Magi, here's the the three implications of Jesus being our great high priest. Number one, he gets us. He gets us. Hebrews 4 says, therefore, since, I want you to notice there's a few little pronouns in here. Since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the son of God, let us hold firmly the faith we profess. Those little pronouns We and us are so inclusive. We were outsiders, but we have been invited in, into the family of God, into the presence of God, all because of Jesus. Verse 15 says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to emphasize with our weakness, but we have one who is tempted in, oh, this is awesome, We have one who was tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let me tell you something wonderful about Jesus. I can relate to him because he can relate to me. He gets us. Jesus had to go through all the developmental phases of every human being. We we sometimes skip over the reality that Jesus, there's a child born in, in that town of Bethlehem, had to learn to walk, had to learn to talk. Does it do your head in to think the Son of God had to be potty trained? He went through puberty with his voice cracking. He, he experienced all the phases of life. He got lonely. He got hungry. He got tired. He was let down. He was betrayed. So I can't go to him in prayer and say, you wouldn't understand. Because he does. He gets you. He gets, so no matter what you're going through, let me tell you, Jesus has been there and done that himself. Bible tells me that his body was trashed, ripped apart, broken. And you read the story of Jesus right through his earthly ministry, from especially from that moment that he was, he was baptized by John. Tempted. All kinds of opportunities to deny his divinity and and literally elevate himself and his importance in his humanity. Say yes to the devil. The Bible says every time he says it is written, he knew the word of God, he was the word of God, he was tempted, yet he was still without sin. So we can't go into situations that God, I don't think I can beat this. I'm struggling with stuff. Stuff in my past. Stuff on a screen. Stuff on a bottle. Let me tell you something. You have a savior that gets you. He's been there. He's been through every challenge known to man. Yet, without sin, he gets you. So you can get him. Somebody say amen. It's a wonderful thing. I've been walking through some really deep waters with some people this week. The challenges that they've been going through. And the best I could offer is that I'm grateful for eternity. The power of the Holy Spirit comes to be a comforter and that Jesus understands. Jesus understands. Then in verse 16, it says, let us approach God's throne of grace with confidence. Isn't this cool? 
We don't have to cower before the living God, creator of heaven and earth. We, we can come before his throne of grace with confidence. Say confidence. So that we may receive, this is awesome, we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. I can come confidently, not based on anything I've done, but based on everything that Jesus has done. And when I come to him, I come as a son. I have two sons. They're both in their 30s. And I can't remember a moment in their life when they've walked into my presence feeling like, number one, they weren't worthy. And number two, they couldn't ask for anything. They get to a season in life where they don't even ask. But that's another thing. There's a, there's a relationship. And with that relationship comes confidence that the Father wants them to have the best. Let me tell you something. Your Father wants what's best for you. And you can come into his presence knowing that there's grace and mercy in your time of need. Anybody glad for that? So he gets us. Here's the second thing about this frankincense. As our great high priest, he has offered the perfect sacrifice for our sins. Read with me Hebrews chapter 9, verse 11. Here's one of these examples of what we are talking about a moment ago. But when Christ came. Up until that, there were things that were ordinary and there were things that were prophetic types and shadows of what would come. But when Christ came as high priest of the good things that are now already here, he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle, which is not made with human hands. That is to say, is not part of this creation. He did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves, but, which, by the way, if you're new to church, that's just the old sacrifices that all the priests used to do in the Old Testament to somehow cover the sins of humanity. He did not come by those means, but he entered the most holy place, the presence of God, I love this line, once and for all. Say it with me, once and for all by his own blood, thus obtaining the eternal redemption, the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkled on those who are ceremonially unclean. Sanctify them so that they are outwardly, note that word, they're outwardly clean. I mean, no, you can be outwardly clean, but inside, still stained with sin. The best that the Old Testament, the best the Old Covenant could do was cover. But when Jesus came, everything changed. Verse 14, I, here's, here's three words. You've heard me preach on these three words. How much more? Say them with me. How much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God. Oh, he didn't cover. What did he do? He cleansed our conscience from acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God. The high priest would offer sacrifices that would cover the people's sins. But when Jesus came, but when Jesus came, I said, but when Jesus came, everything changed. He not only offered the sacrifice that would once cover the sins. No, no, no. He didn't just offer the sacrifice ready for this. He was the sacrifice. He was not only the priest, he was the lamb that takes away the sins of the world. He was the sacrifice and he didn't cover. He cleansed us. Somebody's got to get excited. He cleansed us from all sin and all unrighteousness. We're not just covered until next time. We have been freed and freed indeed by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. So then we can rest in the confidence that Jesus had paid the price once, once. Not year after year, season by season, but once and for all. Here's the third thing about Jesus being our great high priest. Here's the third thing that shows that their gift of frankincense was really quite profound. He now intercedes for us. He gets us. He offered the perfect sacrifice, which was himself. And third thing now, he sits at the right hand of the Father making intercession for us he intercedes for us that was one of the roles of the high priest was to stand before God on behalf of the people to intercede it's not a word we always use but that word means to be an intermediary to explain or to negotiate on our behalf he sits at the right hand of the father as I said he gets us and he can explain to the father oh yes I walked that planet 
Father, th- th- this is where they're at. And he's making intercession for it. I don't know about you, but I find that just unbelievably profound. About 30 years ago, a woman by the name of Joan Osborne brought a song out. The song was called, What If God Was One of Us? Let me tell you something. He was. He was. He's Emmanuel. He, 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 he was one of us. He came as, 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 as God's son wrapped in human flesh to experience the human experience and then die for our sins, but now has risen again. How many are glad for that? He's risen again. He was Emmanuel. And the very exciting news today, and this probably explains if you're new to church, if you were watching online and you're wondering, why do people raise their hands? Why were people clapping? Why are people singing out loud? Let me tell you, they're excited about the fact that Jesus once and for all has taken the power and, and destroyed the grip of sin. Come on, we are freed because of what Jesus done. And through, our, through his, his death, he, des- he destroyed the power of sin and death upon us. But then he rose again and he lives forevermore. Come on, let me read you just one more scripture from the book of Hebrews, verse, verse uh, 23 of chapter 7. It says, now there have been many of those priests. One can only imagine from the early times of the patriarchs right through to when Jesus came, how many high priests there would have been, how many priests serving in the tabernacle. It says, there have been many of those priests since death prevented them from continuing in office. It happens. But because... Jesus, our great high priest, lives forever. He has a permanent priesthood. Therefore, he is able, oh, I love this. Therefore, he is able to save completely. See, this is what I love about Christianity. Religion paints the question, you know, can I ever get right with God? What do I have to do to appease him? But Jesus, once and for all, has done it. And I live in the grace and the mercy that is ours because of him. He's able to save completely those who come to God through him. Look at this. Because he always lives. Oh, some of you need to hear this. He always lives to intercede for them. He not only gets you, can you imagine this? He's sitting at the right hand of the Father, explaining you to a living God. Unbelievable. Sensational. Those magi, I get the gold, but you sometimes look at frankincense. Yeah. It's profound, it's wonderful. Gold, frankincense, next week myrrh. But there was one other thing that we don't always talk about. One other special gift. The Bible says and when they laid those gifts down before Jesus, you know what they did? They brought one other gift. They worshipped him. And I'm going to invite you to stand with me today. And we're going to worship Jesus.